Well, folks, it's been four years and 10 million world-ending reboots later, but I've finally fallen back into Charm's greasy clutches. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. I thought I'd escaped, but eventually my Patreon milestone caught up with me and I had to fulfill my promise of reviewing the Season 9 comics. And briefly, perhaps, I thought they would be an improvement on the show. But let me assure you that even in comic form, Charmed continues to set the bar even lower. It's amazing. You know what the most bizarre thing about all of this is? By the time I get this out, it's gonna be out of date. Hell, it's been going out of date as I write it. This isn't even the first or second intro I did for this. Charm keeps making my world spin so fast. It's like we had four years of nothing, and then unexpectedly everything started happening in Charmed World. Uh, all right, who brought my... Charmed? Back from the dead? First, I had a disclaimer about why my videos kept disappearing after copyright issues on YouTube, then CBS, out of nowhere, releases all of their claims, and the power of three set me free, baby. Well, maybe not out of nowhere. Uh, I can hazard a guess it relates to what I wrote next, which was how even when reposting, my joke about the Charmed reboot somehow continues to be relevant. They're always announcing Charmed reboots. <laughs> we'll see one of those get off the ground, sure. There was like two or three of them announced since I finished the season eight review, including this like prequel series set in the 70s? Eh, I don't know. But anyway, seems one of them actually stuck this time. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. And before I could even finish reading an article about the pilot being commissioned, all of a sudden the trailer drops and Charmed is starting all over again in the fall. Why, Charmed? Why? Why can't you release me from your cold, uncaring dungeon? Are you that cruel a master? Do you think she's mad? I don't know, I guess I'm grateful it isn't a Chris slash Wyatt spin-off show. Sadly, the Neighbor Dan sitcom was dead in the water. And of course, they canceled The Real House Witches of San Francisco. But hey, in case you're curious, this new one? I'll definitely be talking about it when it drops. So keep your eyes peeled, and we'll watch the Charmed Ones destroy the patriarchy together. In the meantime, let's take it back a bit and explore what happened to the original Terrible Trio. Oh, what horrors await as I dive back into the world of the horrible Halliwell sisters. But first, a little retrospective of my own work. And the day was saved. <laughs> I first started these reviews in October of 2013 with a 16 minute video on season one, and each review became longer and longer and more convoluted as the show itself began to unravel, eventually ending with season eight being a two hour long monster even I couldn't control. The show consumed me, so much so that I had to stop doing manic episodes for a while because it was just too much to invest and exhausted me both creatively and physically. It was a lot. But after all was said and done, I had created my longest, most extensive review series and the work I'm most proud of. I recently rewatched the videos in preparation for this, and a few things stood out seeing it with fresh eyes. One, there are definitely things that don't hold up and I would do differently, especially concerning some of my word usage. And for those things, I apologize. I'm gonna try and do better. Two, some stuff got missed because it's just hard to keep track of everything, even with the help of the meticulous Charmed Wiki. Hell, I forgot a lot of the things I brought up because my brain just can't store that much Charmed, and I'm probably going to miss some things here. Sorry, I really do try, but I look forward to reading your corrections. And three, man, the Charmed ones still come off like a bunch of assholes. I promised back then I'd talk about the comics, and now the time of reckoning is at hand, and it seems not a moment too soon. Without keeping you waiting any longer, let's crack open Charmed Season 9. The Charmed comics are helmed by a company called Xenoscope, and one quick Google search will, uh, give you an idea of their particular aesthetic. I've also spoken to a former employee who didn't have great things to say about their working relationship. The stories they wanted were pretty sexist, and their main focus is... well, you can probably tell. It's basically fairy tale based wank fodder. 
Recently, they've revamped their image, so it could be my information is outdated, but this was definitely their niche when they were making Season 9. Some of these issues stem from the comic industry as a whole, but suffice to say, their influence is very much present in the artwork here. Apparently, they were told to tone it down with Charmed, and this is definitely more cleaned up than their usual fare, but look at this nonsense. The girls are constantly sticking out their asses and posing, and almost every woman is drawn the same. And this is not a dig at Holly Marie Combs, but there definitely is a difference in body type between her and the others that is not present here. They're drawn like tiny 17-year-olds. And don't even get me started on the dudes. All of them have like chiseled cheekbone generic face. I genuinely cannot tell them apart unless I see which sister they're standing next to. I mean, look at this. Can you honestly tell me which character any of these men are supposed to be? And I think Henry changed races here. On the bright side, generally I'm able to distinguish which sister is which. The artist really honed in on Paige's dreamy eyes, Piper's evil eyebrows, and Phoebe's rictus smile. But I won't lie to you folks, it's grim. It's really grim. The art in this is shockingly bad. The faces are wonky, the digital coloring is extraordinarily ugly and inconsistent, it's obviously traced, and some of it seems unfinished. Look at the background here, look at it, it's, it's just pencil scribbles. Not even a colored pencil, just like a number two. Now that I think about it, there's a lot of number two in this comic. Look at Phoebe and Paige's faces here, grotesque. And you get a bonus ugly Henry, I think. He doesn't even look like he's lit by the same lighting source. I mean, it's, it, it's creepy, guys. All of the girls are just wearing haunting masks of death. I literally gasped when I saw Phoebe in this panel. I was in such shock. She looks like she was ripped straight out of a clutch cargo creepypasta. This was the last thing somebody saw before they died. I want to highlight this page in particular as being the worst in the entire lot. Literally not a single detail that isn't wrong in some way. This lady's corpse just can't seem to contain her enormous breasts as her ghost checks out Phoebe and Paige's crooked cracks. Meanwhile, Leo turns into a beaver in the foreground. What kind of proportions, perspective, layout? A mess. Just a mess. Let me tell you, I am not trained as an artist. I'm barely knowledgeable about comics, but even I know there's some serious failings here on very rudimentary levels. It also came off extremely unusual, the wide variety in style here. It seems to switch artists every couple issues. I was stunned to see this in something that was officially licensed for the property. A horrifying lack of quality control. Oh, and I hope you're all right with weird emphasis on every other word, because that's how the entirety of this season reads. I couldn't make sense of any of it. Let's go kick some underworld ass. <laughs> I am extremely disappointed to announce I don't really have a terrible Phoebe fashion segment for this, since the clothes are largely unnoteworthy. But I do want to give a special shout out to this particularly atrocious outfit of pages. Monstrous like orange rinds stuck in manure. Okay, so as usual, there's a ton of stuff to parse here, so bear with me. We begin a year and a half after the season eight finale. I mean, the present day stuff, not the horrifying future where it's revealed. All of this was the product of a senile Piper's mind. She reads to a horde of grandchildren. You might recall that a big part of the finale was Billy killing her sister and defeating the greatest evil ever, or whatever they were trying to say, and weeping into the pile of her sister's dusty remains on the floor. But it's not all bad because we see in a flash forward that she's rewarded with the privilege of changing the diapers of Phoebe's awful children. But just kidding, Billy lives in LA now, except when the sisters decide to orb her back east to watch over Daryl when the plot needs it. She's mostly non-existent because, hey, the network isn't mandating any extra characters now, and we can return the focus to the miscreants we all tuned in for, and Coop for some reason. There's like a wall of info here to get readers up to speed with what's happened in the Charmed universe so far, but they can't even stay consistent within that. 
Witches must decide within the first 48 hours of their powers awakening if they will travel the path of good or evil. This is after they mention that often witches exhibit their powers in early childhood. So does that mean a toddler's gotta decide if they're good or evil in the first 48 hours? And what about Wyatt's will he or won't he evil thon What about Phoebe's stint as the evil queen of the underworld? What about Billy's alliance with her evil sister, but she turned back to the side of good in the end? That's talked about on the same page. Charmed, it's okay to pretend certain rules didn't happen if they contradict other things. It's not like you've got anything to lose at this point. And who could forget their amazing Harry Potter magic school? Harry Potter let the older students stay in the battle for Hogwarts. This is not Hogwarts. Another surprise came when Gideon proved to be the one working behind the scenes to turn Wyatt. I thought he was trying to prevent it, working with his mirror universe self to stop a more powerful force. And I don't know, Charm, I'm gonna call bullshit on that one. But look, it's not as if Wyatt was an important part of that season or anything. Our eighth year in magic began with another loss when our friend Daryl moved his family to the East Coast to protect them from a danger the world no longer believed existed. Us. So what are our three wicked witches up to nowadays anyway? Well, Piper's certainly as humble as ever. I grew to become the heart of the Halliwell family, as your mother once put it. <laughs> yeah, it's still funny. If you recall, Piper suddenly remembered after seven years that her dream was to become a chef and she never wanted a club anyway. So P3 has been sold off and now she's starting up the restaurant she always dreamed of. And she's cooking in a midriff tank top and flip-flops? Ew! Don't serve me anything from her kitchen. Unsanitary. I don't want to be thinking about Piper's nasty, hairy toes while I'm eating. No, no, hell no. Leo, try this sweat soup. And don't you dare wuss out on me. The secret ingredient is my lactated poison. Apparently Paige decided to care about magic school again because she's back to being a teacher there. I wish I had more to say, but I really don't. Once again, Paige is shafted in favor of her two wicked stepsisters. Besides, if we talk about Paige at all, we'll miss out on discussing the mighty Phoebe one, ruler of all, the greatest Carrie Bradshaw who ever lived. The first panel of Phoebe that isn't a flashback summary is her ass. Thanks, Xenoscope. And now that they're all married off and having children like every woman with no exception always dreams of, that means we won't have to hear about Phoebe's love life all the time, which is a plus. On the negative side, as she's still Phoebe. She's back to the same old grind, rewriting history as she remembers it and blaming Cole for all of her problems. Lord knows we didn't get enough of that for six years. Though he escaped Balthazar's grasp, our relationship ended in tragedy when he could not overcome the darkness still within him. His half-demon side, Balthazar, was in constant battle with the human half, Cole, when I, Phoebe, fell in love with him. Our tumultuous relationship led to a marriage performed in a dark ceremony, even though our love was pure. Unfortunately, that love was not enough to save Cole when his darkness took control and we were forced to vanquish him for good. Thanks to you, we vanquished the source and gave Cole peace. <laughs> Shame Phoebe didn't know love was her true power back then. Hey, also, quick note, screw you! I cannot believe someone who is unironically written as a hero actually referred to herself as I, Phoebe. This is ground I've covered many times, so I won't be too repetitious, but wow, unbelievable. I mean, they recap that the source possessed him and it wasn't his fault, but conveniently gloss over the fact Phoebe could have saved him, but didn't. They even try to claim Cole was just unvanquishable. Hmm, yeah, unvanquishable. It's the only way out for me. And you want it too, so. Yeah, but on our terms, not yours. You just want us to vanquish you, suicidal Cole, but yeah, we'll do it our way. Speaking of being stuck in a vicious loop of Phoebe's obsessive and obnoxious priorities, her stupid column. As usual, she's surrounded by her flock of sycophants to talk about how she's the Mother Teresa of advice columnists. It's disgusting. Phoebe, I love your column. You are so much cooler than Dr. Phil. With better hair. Barf. You'd be lucky to kiss Dr. Phil's feet.
Look at this. A giant crowd of people wants Phoebe to marry them at the same time? Ugh. And this is all because the paper's publicist filled out a form online and got her ordained without her knowledge. This doesn't even seem legal. This is all some publicity stunt because the newspaper's in trouble, but how can that be when their flagship column is Ask Phoebe? Here's Phoebe as they're going to a funeral. We're going to be late. It's not like the guest of honor will mind. I love it when he wears those jeans. Phoebe! What? I can't look? I simply can't leave the house for this funeral without checking out my brother-in-law's ass. <laughs> my teeth are terrifying. Beginning with these comics, the girls start to gain new powers. Because surely they needed more firepower in their arsenal. I'm not sure if absolute power corrupts absolutely when the party is already more corrupt than anything I've ever encountered, but certainly this can only lead to bad things. Here's Piper melting a street. So that's terrifying. Shazam! The power Paige gains this season is Orb Shield, so sort of like a Sue Storm thing. And hey, at one point she just orbs into a high school in front of some bullies and no one questions it. Or the fact this adult woman who isn't employed at the school is in the boys' bathroom. Creepy. Phoebe learns that she can use someone's anger against them to kill them, so... I guess get ready for the reign of our overlord Phoebe Halliwell. Male advice columnists of the world, beware! She also gets back some of her power she lost for being a complete bitch, but mostly because it would save money, so now she can levitate and her power of empathy returns. Thank fuck. I really wanted to see Phoebe whine about how other people's feelings are inconveniencing her. Yeah, you know, that was something that was sorely missed. Hmm, people screaming in terror around Phoebe. That's a pretty understandable reaction. So, I want to take just a moment to talk about magical babies, because Charmed has severely overestimated how much the audience is interested in this particular plot element. And this isn't to say you can't do a well-done story involving magical families and raising children, but these women are racking them up like Pokemon cards. Look at this nightmare. It's like a daycare full of Cabbage Patch goblins. And straight up, magical babies are the worst. Just the worst. I don't think I've ever seen a super special chosen baby storyline I didn't loathe. It goes hand in hand with my dislike of child of the main character plots in general. And it's not because kids can't be well written, it's that more often than not, they're written in with an unearned importance simply because of their relation to the characters you started watching for. Sure, okay, we know why they're important to their parents, but you have to give the audience a reason to care about them, too. The big takeaway I got from Wyatt is that he looked like the lead singer in Nickelback. They gave me nothing about him to keep me invested in whether or not he was on the side of good or evil. And honestly, can you tell me one thing about who good Wyatt is? One personality element other than inoffensively pleasant. Though I'll at least give them that Chris had a better story arc since they built him up before revealing their definitely no seriously planned twist that he was Piper's son. Uh, for what that's worth. You know what we need after seasons and seasons of stories about Piper's stupid children? How about another one? Can her evil cavernous womb squeeze out a third? Let's not forget her number two character trait. Number one being crabby being a mother. This third unholy abomination is a daughter named Melinda, who is just coming into her powers, which I guess means she's got 48 hours to decide if she's good or evil or not. And this causes a whole host of problems. She creates a beanstalk that attacks them, meaning she has that super powerful projection gift Billy only had. Just kidding, half white lighter kids have it too. But fuck it if they're gonna bind their powers and protect the world and themselves. At least now I know who was behind those vines attacking me a few months back. You already said it was her. And also, what does that have to do with the orbing she's doing? Now I know what you're saying. Piper's got two major storylines for her children, plus this extra little squirt. But how can Phoebe and Paige horn in on this action? Well, by having a bunch of their own little terrors. Without these notes, I couldn't tell you their names. And in fact, I somehow care even less about them. Phoebe and Coop have a baby called Prue, nicknamed PJ, who, surprise, is also a magical super baby with teleporting powers they don't bind. I hope at three months old she made the decision to fight for good in that 48-hour window she got, or they'll have a real Wyatt on their hands. Phoebe, of course, makes her baby's realization of her powers all about herself. Is it wrong that I'm jealous that she has a better power than me? 
Firstborn babies are more powerful than their siblings, which is why Chris and Paige aren't super babies or whatever. I guess that explains some things. What's the deal with half-cupid, half-witch babies anyway? Is there also some bullshit powerful destiny for them? I assume she'll get a crazy useful time travel ring as well, because cupids were secretly the most powerful beings in the charmed universe. Who gives them those rings anyway? Are there elder cupids? Because elder white lighters apparently aren't powerful enough for time travel, at least according to you, Charmed. Then there's Paige and Henry's twins, Tamara and Kat, which makes them a fourth white lighter, I guess. At least there's no Cupid DNA muddying things up for them. Thanks, Grandma Racist. One of Paige and Henry's kids sets fire to their house. By the way, they have their own house now, apparently. Tam can start fires, Cat can freeze things. Henry suggests binding their powers until they're old enough to control it, but as usual for the Charmed Ones, Paige acts like this is akin to suggesting they flay them alive. As she puts it, it's not natural. Well, nothing about magic is natural then, is it? Aren't all powers dangerous in the hands of children too young to control them? Not dangerous enough to warrant us binding her powers. She nearly burnt your house down. Your family could have died. Anyway, Paige ends up binding their powers. That makes her the most sensible one of the group. Hey, you want to guess what horrific thing happens once she binds her children's powers? Nothing, you idiots. <sighs> Do I have them all so far? I guess. I hate this. Not that we'll ever be done because the Charmed Ones are still fertile and ready to spread their demonic seed across the land. If you haven't caught the pattern so far, magic and babies seem to be a recurring theme in our lives. <laughs> Shut up. There's just shit everywhere. Shut up, Leo! Yes, ma'am. Can't go a season without the White Lighters, though, aka the most confusing and convoluted TV mythos of all time. They're constantly referred to as guardian angels here, which, as you recall, were a separate thing that made you clumsy if they died. But that can just be boiled down to semantics. Let's get to the good stuff, mainly the elders being dicks. You might be wondering why Melinda has White Lighter powers when Leo was human when they conceived her. I was a white lighter much longer than I was human. Probably something in my DNA passed on to Melinda. You were a white lighter longer than you were human. There was bound to be some transfer of traits through your DNA. Hey, my oddly specific conclusion was right. No mess up on the part of the comics creators, no sir. Wait, actually, I'm inexplicably angry about my own conclusion now. The elders clipped my wings. They stripped me of my powers. I can't just pass them on to my children, but I guess you can forgive the writers for not being sure because I change what I am a lot and in fact the very reviewer of this comic wasn't even certain until now. I'm all over the place! By the way, you can be forgiven for not knowing who this elder is because all of the men are nondescriptly handsome, but this is Brody. Yes, Kyle, I put an innocent woman into a coma to further my own agenda, Brody, was not only made a white lighter when he was killed, but apparently got a promotion to Elder since the last time we saw him. I guess they decided to wipe out all the old Elders and start anew because White Lighter Land was full of dicks, but I'm not sure if the current regime is that much better. Turns out they gave Melinda her White Lighter powers without anyone's consent because they hoped the Charmed Children would inherit the power of three and be an even more powerful force for good than the Charmed Ones, which... Seems kind of the opposite of what they wanted before, since a lot of them thought part white lighters were abominations, but okay. Then the question is brought up if dark lighters will come after their children. Part white lighters are probably low on the list. Okay, you can't have it both ways and say half white lighter babies are less powerful. Either being half white lighter, half witch makes you a super baby, or it doesn't. Pick one. There are a few one-offs sprinkled throughout this that don't necessarily tie into the main arc, and I want to talk about one particular issue centered on Phoebe. Surely we don't need to move our mouths to talk, just keep smiling creepily. <laughs> Here's where the art gets really scary, guys. I mean, just the stuff of nightmares. I don't know what happened with this issue in particular, but it is rough, friendos. And it was swiftly ended, and the artwork changed abruptly after that. And that says something, considering the other illustrations, they gave a pass for much longer. A majority of this season is pretty frightening, but this takes it to all new levels. Think about that for a moment.
So this terrifying work of a mad person is a direct sequel to Morality Bites, the episode where Phoebe, Piper, and Prue visit the future and learn about the pitfalls of misusing magic, all of which leads to Phoebe committing murder and being burned at the stake. It's probably the best episode Charmed ever made, and did a pretty stellar job predicting the dark journey these unrepentant Gorgons would take. Obviously, Prue is out of the picture now, but I found the idea of revisiting the episode pretty intriguing, and I was interested in seeing how events would play out now that the sisters are aware of where that path led them. As you can probably guess, the results leave a little to be desired. It immediately begins with Phoebe writing her advice column, which is a pretty good indicator of how much enjoyment you're gonna get out of this story. Trust, they say it's the foundation for any healthy relationship. I certainly won't disagree. Misplaced trust is what kept me from finding love for so many years. Trust is the foundation of any relationship. Also, don't trust anyone. <laughs> Phoebe's publicist, Mika, is seeing a famous baseball player named Cal Green. Cal is the guy who Phoebe murdered for killing her friend in the possible dog shit future. So I guess Mika was that friend? who I didn't even realize was the same character from Volume 1 until I read the Charmed Wiki. She appears in a grand total of two issues, so I can see why future Phoebe resorted to murder and got burned at the stake for this woman. They can't even keep things consistent in the same issue. Mika's hair keeps switching back and forth from red to black. Obviously, Phoebe is concerned when she finds out who Mika is seeing, so she arranges a double date to snoop this guy out. Apparently, her version of investigation includes acting all passive-aggressive and then hand-feeding the guy? The hell? Darn, cuckold it again! Stupid SJW misogyny! Ah, demon claws! I should note, there are a lot of scary hands here. Well, if Phoebe can't kill the guy, she might as well expose him. And for that, she's gonna need Elise. I'm tough but hard to look at. Elise says she was trying to run a story on Cal's abuse, but he started threatening the paper with lawsuits, which then evolved into violent threats. Unfortunately, she can't prove it was him. <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. He was actually, like, throwing baseballs at them? Seriously? <laughs> well, gee, if only they could prove the baseball-themed threats were done by or on behalf of the famous baseball player. I tell ya, your profession dictates how you run your entire life. After this, Phoebe has a vision of Elise dying. No, not one of her best friends outside of her sisters, as she claims, which is both ludicrous and sadly believable. I'm so upset about this, my face is disappearing! Despite them having a heads up, Cal still manages to sneak into Elise's office and terribly injure her. So thanks, Phoebe! Shit, I was supposed to be protecting her? I was too caught up in staring at myself in the mirror for hours! Phoebe finally lets Elise in on the fact she's a witch, something she takes remarkably well, all things considered, and then puts into action an amazing plan. Have Paige glamour herself into looking like Cal so she can pretend to beat up Elise over a webcam! We uh, what? How is this not something that counts for personal gain? I mean, wasn't that the entire point of the episode that this is a sequel to? That they can't use magic just for revenge? Who pretended to be Elise? Or did they just beat her all over again? Would that not be horribly traumatic for Elise to be healed and then have to reenact her own vicious beating moments later? The hell? And so Elise leaped from beating to beating, hoping the next punch will be the punch home. Now we can get into the actual story arc. Er, the first one, anyway. The season is broken up into four volumes and two major storylines, so we'll start with first things first. Basically, a lot of this is going to involve the concept of the Grand Design, which in the Charmed Universe is really just a bunch of gobbledygook. I mean, in the simplest terms, the Grand Design is like... Everything in life has a reason, a place in the bigger picture. A blueprint, if you will. But in Charmed Land, this is only in a relative sense. What you are planning is not part of the grand design. The enemies you scheme against have fulfilled their role in battle. So like, if people have their own choices that don't fit in with what the Angels of Destiny planned, then like, there is no grand design, right? I mean, people can just do whatever the hell they want. Anyway, this is our main big bad for the moment, Nina and her buddy Hogan. Magic champions, brother! 
She's majorly powerful and sends this angel of destiny away, which should probably be a big deal, but I was super distracted by the fact she does this in the middle of a club and no one notices. Like, no one. But then she killed this guy touching her ass, and then all of a sudden it's like people have eyes and ears. Butt crack! These two dumb shits want to resurrect the source, so they gotta steal some dirt from the ancient burial ground where the hollow is kept. The hollow being that thing so dangerous that all of good and evil hid it away and ended up boning the source in the end because he's an idiot. So how do they get their hands on this dirt? They just show up where the angel and demon dudes are protecting it and do the equivalent of, hey, look over there, and they leave. Uh, yep. That's, uh, that's it. Cool beans, dudes. I cannot believe we're going to the source well again. I mean, the last time we saw him, he was in a filler episode where he was vanquished after five minutes of screen time. Even the demons in the underworld seem to know how tired this plot is. Wasn't the source vanquished? I've lost count of how many times. I thought we vanquished him for eternity last time, or the time before that. Probably just his demon form. The actual essence of the source is... Well, he is the source of all evil. You know, calling him the source of all evil ceases to have any meaning when he keeps getting foiled like a second-rate Scooby-Doo villain. And it becomes even less of a deal when you realize he's just a pawn in Nina's scheme. So honestly, just retire the source, guys. So let's get more into that. It wouldn't be charmed unless they failed to save some innocence, but this time it goes even further because they're retroactively losing innocence they saved before they became giant scabs, meaning they're negating any good they ever did on the show. Then again, the amount of people they saved could be counted on one hand. It's unusual that once this starts happening, they jump right in to help. Maybe fighting with Billy and Christy gave them brain damage, so they forgot what butt munches they were for a bit. They're clued in to all of this happening when the first innocent they ever saved dies. <laughs> hey, did you know you can just open a coffin at a burial and nobody cares? I knew things had been quiet for too long. This is ridiculous. I'm trying to open a restaurant. I have three kids. I don't have time for demons. Why is this happening? Well, Nina and the Source want to keep the girls distracted while they enact their big bad plan. In addition to the killing, they start making the non-magical folks around them go crazy. What's up with their eyes? I'm thinking spell, which means we can't hurt them. What? Why would it mean that? You heard people under spells all the time. Our guests are savages. I caught one of them peeing in the kitchen sink this morning. I'm hoping it was at least a guy. How would that make it better? This is coming from the same genius who came to this conclusion like a page previously. It's been a few days since the last attack. Maybe the threat has passed. Or maybe I'm an idiot. What do you think? This is all sort of pointless anyway, because after the source goes to all this trouble, he just shows up at their house to attack them? Like, what was the distraction for? Well, the girls are gonna need a bigger boat to get rid of him this time. That's when the Phosphorus Cauldron comes into play. It was left behind by the demons that invaded magic school, but despite that, the object is neutral because Piper says so. Paige then collects magic from everyone who's ever helped them so they can create the strongest potion ever. Okay, but I'm not going near the fairies, or the leprechauns, or the nymphs. Seriously, no leprechauns. At least there's no leprechaun DNA muddying things up for them. <laughs> I really want to know, why are they so racist against leprechauns? Of all the continuity to remember, honestly. This potion will be paired up with the spell to end all spells by taking something from every page of the Book of Shadows, which just sounds like nonsense. I mean, like, if they could just take random words and just throw it all together to do whatever they want, then why did they bother with anything they did on the show? Seriously. But that's really a moot point, because Phoebe just says fuck it and does something else, so I don't even know why they introduced this concept. They took Chekhov's gun off the wall and just threw it in the fireplace, didn't they? Oh, and Excalibur, because that's still a thing they want to go with. But hey, there's Billy! Surely a fourth witch will strengthen them. Are you sure I can't help? Just knowing you're here if we fail helps, Billy. <laughs> Sucks to be you, Billy. <coughs> Piper seems to be leading this parade, and for some reason, Coop brings up Shax out of nowhere, the warlock that killed Prue, which 
I mean, I guess the source sent him, but this really had nothing to do with anything. Nobody was talking about Prue or Shax. Why are you trying to remember things now, Charmed? You stopped doing that forever ago. I saw some crazy stuff before. Pages told me stories. But this is... Not that bad, actually. Yep. And what was Phoebe's brilliant deviation from their super spell plan? Eh, just a power of three spell. Whoa! Thanks for the excitement, Charmed. Gotta love their favorite deus ex machina. Goodbye, Source. I look forward to your next resurrection, where you continue to have the impact of a wet piece of toilet paper. <laughs> With the Source vanquished, Nina disperses his power to all of the minions in the underworld to unite them, thus leading into the next volume. Also, I think Hogan died at some point. The Source came back and tried to kill us. We vanquished him again. Our powers are evolving. And I'm going to write a book. It's all about me. But the big question remains. Just who is Nina anyway? Well, it turns out she's the first witch. We're up against the first witch? That anything like the first slayer? Well, if you just want to state what storylines you're ripping off, okay. It's nice to see Charm deviating from ripping off Sex in the City to return to its roots of ripping off Buffy. Hey, just a quick note, the new white lighter in that reboot trailer? Total Giles, right? You know, maybe this reboot will be pretty faithful to the original after all. I don't even like wearing witch costumes on Halloween, like, not even slutty ones. Oh jeez. Oh man. Oh boy. Uh, listen, what follows is just pages and pages and pages of exposition dump. It is untenable. I cannot believe how long this goes. I'm gonna try and summarize, but I gotta apologize ahead of time because it's gonna get wordy and confusing. Oh no. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Nina came from a time before names, and back then a spiritual energy existed that ran through everything, neither good nor evil, and it's called the All. It's kind of like the Hollow, but it's called the All. You think the Nexus under the manor is powerful? It barely registers when compared to the Nexus of the All! Wait, so there's more than one Nexus? We need another confusing fart cloud plot device? <coughs> the Nexus of the All infused Nina with her powers, and that's how the first witch came about, or something. The Nexus created a state of consciousness beyond the known physical universe, a higher realm of state of bliss. <sighs> this is just a whole lot of boring nonsense. Long story short, Nina and her mate were forced to leave the Higher Realm because it was killing the Earth or something, and I guess now she wants that power back. There's also some Adam and Eve imagery, and I really hope that's not what they're implying because, wow. You know, this whole story is sounding kind of familiar. You think? Many belief systems grew out of the same source material. Oh, just fuck off. This is barely a parallel, and I wouldn't even know what the hell you were talking about if there hadn't been an apple drawn in there. Oh, I'm not done with the exposition, by the way, because that would only be merciful. Nina had two children, and from each of them descended witches and warlocks. So good and evil is still genetic, and apparently magic is one big incest hole. I thought warlocks were just witches that turned evil. They are, but some are born that way too. Leo says that non-magical descendants can tap into the magic as witch practitioners or give birth to full witches, but this can upset the grand design. The charmed ones are part of her bloodline, and every time a witch is born, she inherits a piece of the all. Guys, my eyes are glazing over at these pages and pages of drivel. They're just throwing out words. I mean, they can't even draw it interestingly. Half of it is Leo just standing around in a living room talking. Here's what Paige has to say about the first witch Nina, by the way. Not exactly a witch as we traditionally define witches. What does that even mean? Nina's mate was returned to the higher realm without her because the elders wanted to restore the balance of power or something because the all was spread too thin. But if the charmed ones can use this opportunity to make something about fighting those stupid menfolk, they're gonna take it. Okay, all of those suddenly on Nina's side, raise a hand. He totally ditched her for paradise. I'm siding with the person we just saw murder a bunch of elders and as far as we know, killed Piper. Girl, Girl power. power! Sure, taking down those penis havers is great and all, but what are you gonna do without no man? <coughs> and so Nina wants to bring together the heavens and the underworld to reunite with her beau. <sighs> Fuck. You might have noticed Leo's been laying low throughout all of this, sticking to the sidelines as headmaster of magic school, an odd profession for someone with no magical powers to speak of. 
Brody states he can restore Leo's wings because Rennick is back. God, no! Not Rennick! Whoever the hell that is! I'll spoil it. He's a dark lighter that Leo's got a centuries-long feud with. His apparent vanquishing was what got him the job as the Charmed One's white lighter. So that was Rennick? Not much of a threat. All he did was hide and run off! You're saying this over the corpses of two people he just killed! So Rennick was not so dead after all, and is recruited by Nina. But as far as the Charmed Ones are concerned, Nina states, I wanted to keep them out of this. Well then why did you raise the source from the dead, whose sole goal was to kill them, and then bring Rennick back, who has a grudge specifically with Leo, and in fact inadvertently made him the White Lighter for the Charmed Ones? Man, she is just... she's not good at this. She keeps talking about hiding her true plan from the demons when they're all, like, right behind her. This Leo slash Rennick beef amounts to nothing, by the way. Leo can overcome him when he doesn't even have any powers, so, like, how good was this guy anyway? He even beats him when he's chained up? Useless. <laughs> Rennick tells such menacing tales of their rivalry as the time he made some zombies reenact the Thriller music video. Truly a terrifying nemesis. What a walnut. Seeing as how Leo lost his wings because the elders were dicks and made him choose between his duties and his family, he's understandably on the fence about getting his wings back and says no for now. At least now I've decided of my own free will. But what if we need to protect the kids? Don't make me melt your head further into your body. <laughs> I've gotta say, they really got Piper's stink face down. I don't know what the fuck happened here though. Some point before all of this Nina stuff comes to a head, she traps Piper in a recreation of the All. For some reason. This is also a place that exists outside the Grand Design. I'm beginning to think this Grand Design stuff is all a bunch of horseshit. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is that Cole is here. Aw oh, shit, it's like a guy can't even stay in hell anymore. Thanks, Cole Bama. You completely dated this meme. It's kind of hilarious that Piper doesn't seem to really give a shit why Cole's there. Despite the fact the last time he saw her was to save her life and help Phoebe believe in love again, all she can think about is how this relates to him being evil. Is this all some kind of ploy to get Phoebe back? Because she's happily married now, with a child. Cole's neck snaps in response to this news, apparently. Perpetually cursed to follow the Charmed Ones around and have to listen to their constant bitching. This truly is worse than hell for Cole, and dare I say the audience? Meanwhile, Nina and her army of demons attack the elders at the Golden Gate Bridge. Because even in the comics, this is their meeting place instead of, you know, White Lighter Land. This is where Brody is made, er, double dead? Technically, Kyle was already dead. He's only moved on. Moved on to where? Isn't White Lighter Land kind of like heaven or something? You shouldn't be here. You haven't moved on. Wait, so they can choose not to move on? Then what's the point of anything? Eh? I'm still really unclear on why Nina gets Rennick for this, or really what he brings to the table, other than the fact they needed a reason for Leo to be involved again. He tries to convince Leo the world will be better like this because there will be no rules, no grand design. Why did I kill? Why were you so focused on stopping me? Because those were the rules. It was the roles we played. The way we were defined. Uh, what? I mean, Nina's not wrong that the elders are dicks, but like, none of this makes any sense to say no one has free will when this is coming from a person who doesn't exist in the grand design. It's not destined to happen if it can just be changed willy-nilly, now is it? And I mean, look, Rennick's just talking about life. It's just life, dude. Sometimes you don't get along with people and get into centuries-long magical fights with them. You gotta take responsibility for your own actions. In order to get into White Lighter Land, she and her flunkies coerce Paige into opening the doors. I thought the reason she kept meeting the elders on that stupid bridge was because as a half-White Lighter, she had limited abilities and couldn't orb in there by herself. Oh, whatever. Nina won't hurt any of her descendants for some reason, except warlocks, I guess that's okay, but she's alright with Rennick doing it? Ah, but I never killed anyone good. I only killed the evil and the annoying. Like that guy who touched her ass. She's truly a misunderstood saint. Turns out taking over White Lighter Land is super easy. So the robed idiots get tossed out on their asses and the demons take over. The good guys retreat and during the fight, Paige is injured and sent into a coma. I don't feel anything, no emotions. Well, that's normal for the least empathetic person with empathy. 